Yes lads, what is going on? Welcome to Season 5, Episode 7 of the Troy Sports Podcast. In this episode, we are joined with David McCarthy. Um, in terms of running um, and all sides of running from coaching, broadcasting and being an athlete himself, David ticks all three boxes. In terms of being an athlete, he um, got bronze in the Under-23 European Championships back in his day. He was also two-ton indoor national champion. He's also run a 3.55 one mile um, and has just r- done really, really well in terms of the actual running side of athletics. But now and over the past couple of years, he has branched out into other areas. Um, he has coached, he's coached some of the top athletes in Ireland at the moment, including Darren McElhenney, who's gone on to become an Adidas athlete and gone on to set many, many new junior records and has gone on to do great, great things, medal at European Cross Country Championships um, over the past two years. So he is very well engaged in the coaching side of athletics um, and he is, a- as you find out in this episode as well, he's very, very knowledgeable in coaching from the sessions you need to do to be a long-term athlete and he gives us thoughts on cross training and the types of cross training and gym work and strength and conditioning and everything the, even the mindset side of being a young athlete as well so it's a very very knowledgeable um, episode with David even in terms of um, the coaching side of athletics and finally he is now the European correspondent with Sidious Mag so he's had a great great summer working with Sidious Mag and um, especially with the great summer we had over in Budapest with the world championships he was at the on um, events where he got to test a lot of the on um, on runners he got to interview Jakob Ingerbitsen and Fake Yegon and um, Carson Warham and so many great great athletes David um, doing many many great great interviews on them athletes so he discusses that experience and his entire summer now being Sidious Mag's European correspondent. Link to David's Instagram is down in the description and the show notes if you want to check it out as he's uh, a really, really great guy and is very much immersed in the world of athletics. Before we jump into this episode, I want to give a sh- huge shout out to the sponsor of the podcast, Mini Athletic. Um, Mini Athletic supports your child all the way from the age of two to the age of seven in building great great skills not only in athletics but for life such as organization skills teamwork skills communication skills you're learning how to jump to run to throw all in a in form of great amazing athletics games they're currently based in dundalk drogheda and swords but they can be booked to come to your school to come for your birthday or just for a fun day out so do definitely get in touch with niall fergus from mini athletics niall's uh, instagram is down in the description the mini athletics tiktok or sorry the mini athletics instagram is down in the description below as well as the mini athletics website if you want to find out more information so a big thank you to niall and everyone over at mini athletics for sponsoring the podcast but with all that said i hope you all enjoy this episode of the podcast with city of smags very own david mccarthy that I, like i said it's about like keeping routine going right like so like so you don't feel sluggish and unmotivated like you're you're used to setting that time each day where you're getting up going to the gym doing something like you would if you were going out running yeah. so it's it, it, half the time too as you can see with anyone who's trying to you know forget non even runner runners people who are trying to create new habits for the first time the hardest thing about getting going is creating the habit yeah. it's not actually the effort itself like as they always say the hardest thing is setting the time putting on the shoes and getting out the door the act of exercise itself is actually not so hard yeah once you start it's not too bad no no not at all no well david look through through this episode like um it's a good bit on on city and kind of that side of of your life at the moment but i do have you're running and coaching in here as well and i think yeah the, the advice you have as we go through through the episode like once once you click record here that that'd be good for for kind of for people to hear do you know what i mean because i know that you've you've coached people like darren mcelhenny now who's going on to do good things so obviously the advice you have is great so when we get to that segment of 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 the show kind of ju- just for you to give as much of your, your advice as, as, as you can do you know what i mean definitely are you you're just out of curiosity here you're still test recording right now are you oh like i'm good to go if you're if you're ready to go man you should like i think even just what we spoke about at the start there is valuable information to anyone who's gone through injury so i think that's good to keep in it as well anyway perfect yeah i i've i uh, i have i have record started there so um, perfect man so let's let's get into it yeah definitely so 
Uh, joined on the show today with David McCarthy. David, uh, not only uh, in, in, in your prime, I suppose, and, and when you were running as, as much as, as you wanted to and became two-time indoor national champion and third in the under-23 European Championships, you, you've, you've dove into a different aspect of running in, in your life now with, with City of Mag. So maybe for, for the people listening in who mightn't be too aware of who you are and what you're all about, do you want to give a quick introduction? Yeah, so I suppose, um, you know, my background is like, obviously, you know, was running myself, um, was running my whole life. Like, you know, I was Munster cross country champion at the age of seven and I was in it from then. Kieran Lennard was, uh, you know, my main, my main rival and friend all the way from the age of seven, all the way up to our senior years. And, you know, we kept each other going and because of the level we were at, we were able to push ourselves on to, to new heights and that. And so... Yeah, I went through all primary school, you know, when you're in primary school, you're running, you know, the big one is the, the community games and, um, you know, I went through that one, that one year and then um, into secondary school and like every secondary school athlete, you know, you go through the whole um, school cycle. So the yearly calendar usually starts off with, you know, September, you're doing club cross country um, January comes around, you're doing schools cross country. Um, you know, April, May comes around, you're doing schools track and then onto the club outdoor track in the in the summer season. And then, you know, as I got a little bit older in secondary school and I became into the age group of the youths and uh, and juniors, I was, you know, competing. You know, I was I was I was quali- getting the qualifying times uh, for European Youth Olympics, World Youths. Um, like I ran European Youth Olympics in the 800. Um, I came second in that in Lignano in, oh man, I can't, I, like my guessing now of years, maybe 2000 and I don't know, three or something like that. And then, or five maybe. And then uh, went on to juniors and ran at European juniors, ran at world juniors, actually ran the 800 at world juniors in Beijing. Um, again, what year was it? On? So maybe 2006. And who who actually won the World Junior 800 that year was David Rodisha. Oh, um, yeah, yeah. And of course, I didn't. And of course, through the Sidious thing again, I got to meet David Rodisha at World Championships when we were uh, in Budapest this summer. Uh, we had him on the show and that. And uh, I was able to say, I actually, uh, we actually raced against each other. I, like it, it was, it was, it was just cool because obviously. He's gone on to what he's done. And even at the time when he won, like I didn't, you know, know the name David Rodisha. I just knew this big, tall, lanky um, Kenyan won it. So and it wasn't for years later that I kind of put two and two together. And I went back to look at the results and I was like, holy shit, like it's David Rodisha with my world juniors. I didn't really know that at the time. How did race go between, between you and David? Obviously, because oh man, no, I was no, I was no, I, I was no competition for uh, competition for him. Unfortunately, like back in the day, I, I did a lot of 800 when I was in secondary school. But I don't think, even though I was always winning all Irelands and running fast enough, like as a, as you know, I had the uh, the Irish under 18 record in the 800 um, until like of uh, Mark English, Mark English broke it, or maybe it was Carl Griffin first and then Mark English, or uh, vice versa. Um, and uh, and so I came, like I said, came second in the European Youth. But I also felt that I just never felt I was going to be fast enough to be running like, you know, 145s or faster than that. And I always felt like I had my strength was probably more my endurance aerobic side. Um, so it wasn't until kind of then, um, you know, later in my secondary school days when I joined um, uh, some of the lads down here in Waterford. Uh, uh, in the ferry bank group so brendan quinn would have been doing the coaching there so brendan is our actual is the national record holder in the steeplechase uh, for ireland and um he made the the solo olympics and was an 86 or that but uh, he coached a lot of us down there so we had a good group at the time like niall tui i'm not sure if you're familiar with his name but niall is like he's a national 800 meter uh you know uh champion indoors and he's uh He's ran 148 or something like that in the 800. But like I was down with him. I don't know if you remember the name Shane Quinn. Shane Quinn would have been a very good runner back in the day too in the schools. He went on to Providence College as well. So we had a really good group. And then I kind of started more into like, um, I suppose, upping my mileage, maybe yeah. bringing back the intensity of workouts and doing more longer endurance workouts. And I got a massive kick off that. And I started to feel like kind of the, the athlete I should be. And, and then, it, you know, it was off the back of that then. That was six years. So then obviously I, I always wanted to go to America on scholarship from a very young age because I knew like that was the way everyone went. You know, when you look back at my time, I was looking back at 
Eamon Coughlin, Marcus O'Sullivan, Frank O'Mara, Ray Flynn, John Tracy. John Tracy is is literally the, the village beside where I live here. You know, the, 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 the coach that got John Tracy coaching back in the days who got me into the sport. So I always had my eyes on that. And naturally enough, if you're a young kid coming up and you're winning, you associate you're going to follow the same path as these people. So... Yeah, so when I was in secondary school, I it, it was Halloween break sixth year. I took a recruiting trip over to um, America and I checked out Providence and Villanova. You must remember too, at the time there was no Instagrams or flow yeah, tracks or yeah. Sidious mags, so I didn't know really about any other place there. I just knew about the Irish history in these places, so I was just nailing it down to. Even though I got offers from a lot of different schools, I didn't really know anything about them. It was um, a really and so experience for you at that time because now. I could kind of go over to them places and already know what they look like and who's there and, and, and the facilities that they have on offer. But for you then, it was more a, a shot in the dark compared to how it is now. Well, 100%, man. Like, yeah, there was no, like, you, you, there was nothing you could see about it online, you know? Um, only just, you know, vaguely knowing about some of the Irish athletes that went there and they did well. So you assume, okay, well, I should do well there. And uh, so I went over on my recruiting trips, visited Providence and Villanova, two amazing places. Um, but I just ended up, I suppose, more my gut feeling was uh, moved towards Providence. And so, yeah, so that's then, you know, did my sixth year and uh, the start of September 2007 or to August 2000, September, uh, August 2007, I headed over to the States and started my collegiate career over there. And uh, yeah, that went well, man. Like, you know, I, you know, good success there. I remember my uh, you know, I ran my sub four minute miles there. Like I suppose I caught a couple of all Americans while I was there. I ran my first sub four minute mile was in my second year there. I ran three fifty seven, and um, then my final year there I ran three fifty five in the mile. Um, tell, and tell us uh, a bit about that, David, in terms of then running three fifty seven and three fifty five compared to it now, because you see loads of loads of high schoolers going into college over into in America already running well under sub four you know you've you've some dipping into that 355 already tell tell us about you running that 355 and 357 then compared to how it is now yeah so it's like everything man you know i like you know like you know as it, as the saying goes high tides raise all boats right so yeah. you know you you always although we 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 think about times you're always comparing yourself to who's the best at the time right so even take it back further than what i did there was a point when nobody had broken four minutes in the mile, right? And then Roger Bannister in some, like, was it 1966 or 68, he breaks four minutes for the mile, right? And next thing, almost a week later, it's broke again. And then, boom, after that, then it starts happening. So you, 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 you're competing against, like, you're always looking at who's the best. And that's what you need to do. So if you know, if you think that, you know, at the time it takes somebody to just be able to barely break a four-minute mile to be NCAA champion, that's the type of shape you have to get into. And obviously... You know, as one person does it, the other person does it. And in order to be the four minute guy, you've got to run 359. In order to be a 359 guy, you've got to run 358 and so on and so on. And so that's why we've seen now these times coming down, you know, so fast. And obviously, then you have the introduction of the carbon shoes, which like when I ran my 355 mile, it was just a normal New Balance spikes, you know, and even my 357 back in the day was in a pair of Reebok spikes, non-carbon. But regardless of like, you know, so the, yes, the, the shoes will make the times faster, but you're still going to be if everyone has the shoes, the best are still going to be the best and 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 down along the chain, you know. So, you, you know, like, like, you know, obviously, like now you look at people running fast, but I'm sure like if my time came back again and I was around now, that's the standard I'd be looking at and trying to get to. So, like, you know, when you look back in the day and a world champion wins a 1500 and 335, at the end of the day, that man was the best man in the world at the time. And only because of that man running 335, it inspired others to run faster, you yeah. know. If, if, David, if you were to now put on the carbon spikes in the current shape that you're in and, and hit the track, what, what time are you looking for for a mile? Oh, sure. Look, man, it's like I, I, I have been able to like, you know, because I'm obviously still fit and that I, I, I can, I, you know, and, I, and now I wear the carbon shoes, whether it's out on the road or I have the, 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 the likes of the dragonflies. And I even this summer I got the new on spikes, which yeah. are absolutely ridiculous. Yeah. Like I just, they, they you know, really so popular. yeah, so the ping off them, honestly, like, you know, I was talking to Ray Tracy. Ray Tracy was home there last Christmas and we, you know, we were we were just, you know, chatting and he was saying like, you know, Dave, he says like, you know, with the new shoes right now, he reckons like my 355 could be, you know, anywhere down around a 350, 
352 to 353, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And like, you gotta, you gotta think like, yeah, I, I, I like to think, okay, if I put it in perspective of this, if I'm doing a session in carbon shoes or carbon spikes, and even if I break it down to four hundredths, man, they're definitely worth a second a lap. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and, and not only that, you're actually able to operate at higher velocity, higher speed without using as much energy and force. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So you're not tiring yourself as much. So, yeah, so look, it's hard to put a direct measure on, measurement on it, but they, they are significantly faster. And I mean, you, you, you are talking, I mean, you're, you're talking minimum, you know, you're talking anywhere from your two to five seconds, I think, you know, for, for a mile, like depending, like depending on the individual, the athlete, and then also the running mechanics of the athlete. I really think those carbon shoes would have helped me because I was a very like four foot runner, you know, kind of, you know, very poppy in my stride. So I really think I would have maximized that carbon in the shoe. Definitely, definitely, because you do you do see the the carbon plates and a lot of the foam up towards that for, forefront of the shoe, so that kind of poppiness would have would have definitely helped you. But um, tell tell us, David, a little bit about the on running shoes and the spikes, because we 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 seen like Lagoose in, in the World Championships and then obviously in the in the Diamond League final in Oregon, he's become a big, I suppose, force in, in the on running scene. And obviously we have our own Luke McCann here in Ireland who's uh, who's sponsored by on running as well. But from, from your first-hand point of view, the, uh, how they work for you? Because they are starting to come into the limelight pretty pretty rapidly. Yeah, so I've got both the On um, Spike and the On Carbon shoe, the Echo one. It's quite an expensive shoe. It's like 300 euro. Okay. Um, and actually, I ran like I ran a 5K road race there just during the summer there. And uh, like it's my, it was my first race out, and I threw on the, 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 the On ones, and I ran 1423 in the road, and I haven't ran a 5K since 2016. So... That was a that was a pretty decent opener for a 5k. So um, they're fast. What I like about the on shoe is I think it's really good for track work because you know the way a lot of the new carbon shoes now have quite a high stack in them, so like you're quite raised up. Yeah. Sometimes that can feel a bit funny when you're running around the track because of the bends. Where I definitely think the on one because it's a little bit lower profile, it gives more of a natural uh, r- racer type feel to it. But obviously it's very rigid, so it's got that carbon plate where there's good return off it. Um, Probably the on one I would probably use more for 5k down and then for track workouts, but then maybe going longer, I'd probably use a carbon shoe that maybe had a bit more cushion in it. Yeah. Um, and then as regards to spike, I haven't got to racing the spikes yet, but when I was out in Budapest, I brought it out with me and I did it. I went to the track one day and I did 11 by 200 and I kind of, I was running 28s for it and I, I hadn't done a session like that in, you know, y- you know, years really like, so um, to be able to still fork out, you know, t- 28s, feeling quite smooth and comfortable and the minute I got on the track I could just feel the ping off them and I definitely think the on ones are are, are even faster than the dragonflies for sure that's but there's two on ones now there's a 1500 and a 10,000 meter spike it's the 10,000 meter spike all the pro athletes in the goose Mario Garcia all of those guys wear so if anyone is buying or listening to this go for the 10,000 meter spike not the 1500 meter spike even if you are an 800 or 1500 meter runner what why is that david like the, compa- like you know obviously nike have their own specific to the 1500 mm. and 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 the 10k and the 800 but on what why are you going for for the 10k one over the the, the shorter distance bike so i haven't worn the shorter distance bike this is just what all the pros are wearing and everything um i don't know maybe what they've done with the like with the with the longer spike maybe they've put a bit more into it and through that then there's a bit more response off it um, so like if you look at maybe like the uh, you know like like take for example um, Nike with the the car the, the vapor fly and then you have the streak you know the streak yeah. Um, yeah so so like even though the streak like is marketed at like five five k ten k and like track running like. The, the Vaporfly is still, like, you're not going to wear the streak in a 5K road race over the Vaporfly, right? So it's it's kind of like trying to bring something else in for an alternative, but it's still not better. Um, I You know, and maybe they will work on that. Like, On is still a new company, and, and they're developing, and they are developing rapidly, but, you know, they're a new company very relative to, like, the Nikes or that. And then same with the Nike, you have the the victory uh, carbon one now compa- uh, um, to the dragonfly one. And again, like, Killian, a lot at the end of the day too, it comes down to your own comfort. Like, you know, I, like, like I always say to someone like, go try on a shoe, go try on a spike, you know, run in it, uh, you know, t- put it on. If it feels good, perfect. Like that's it. Like just go with what makes you feel good. Don't necessarily be following the crowd because everyone's foot is different. Everyone's foot strike is different. It is. 
I think social media nowadays in terms of like what you said there about the the streak the the, the night streak is like y- you see all these posts on Instagram with the picture of the shoe and and they're put into categories and people kind of start overthinking then you know what I mean like oh I need yeah. to get all four pairs for when yeah. I'm doing all of the distances but like you said you're not going to wear the streak over the vapor fly next percent no 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 like listen man I'll, I'll happily take a pair of streaks if I'm giving them for free but I'm not going to buy them because yeah. they're just not needed you know yeah definitely definitely because I have a 5k race on on uh, Sunday and like if someone handed me the the uh, the streaks or the, the vapor fly next percent trees and I have the the next percent trees here I'm obviously going to wear them do you know what I mean yeah, yeah. yeah um, and David, obviously a big thing that's that's been happening in in your life lately is is now being the European correspondent for uh, for City of Mag, which is in in in, in runnings in terms of running and you know that that's that's absolutely huge. And in terms of being an Irish cor- you know European correspondent, but from Ireland, that's even bigger as well for for the Irish running community. Do you know what I mean? It's 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 great to see where it can lead in terms of, you know if you're if you're not running as fast but how you can stay in the sport at such a big level like like you're doing and obviously you had a, a great athletics career yourself and you're still running really really well yourself but it's it's a really really big thing because everyone in the running community now sit you smart yeah man it's 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 mad and it's it's mad how things happen you know because like um that just you know that just landed on my doorstep you know that opportunity to be with them and, and you're exactly right what you said there like you know it's it's not like, you know, first and foremost, I ran because I was a good runner and I enjoyed it, but also I'm passionate about the sport. But when you're not running at the level anymore, you know, of like making Irish teams get into Europeans or world type championships or that, you're not in the loop, right? And um, and so it's, it's unless you're a, a you know, a, a world-class coach, you know, so a world-class athlete, world-class coach, um, agent, something to do with some of the shoe companies, you know, um, or like, you know, a, a meet director. You're not really getting into the environment of where all these pros are. And, and then the other side, obviously, is... Yeah, and then the other side is obviously the media side. And what's cool about the media side is you don't have necessarily any specific preference to one athlete. So if I was a coach of a professional running team, like it would be just those athletes where like in the media side, it's, it's allowed me to get to know everyone and speak to everyone. Um, and like, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. Like you're in the mix zone there, like, and you know, my first, one of my first, well, my first gig was the on track night in London, but the first diamond league was Florence. And in that Florence night, like, you know, fake Kipiegan breaks the world record in the 1500, like, and the first, like, you know, one of the first people she's talking to, she's achieved this massive, you know, uh, you know, result is me, you know, I get to be there off. And, you know, when these athletes are running or when Jakob Ingebrigtsen breaks the world record in the two mile, like I get to speak to him there and then, like, you know, and, um, and I get to ask the questions that I want answers to, man, like, because I'm a, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a fanatic of the sport. I'm interested in the sport from both still my own running, but from a coaching point of view, like, what is it, does it, what does it take to get to these levels, you know? You know, obviously there's the training aspect, but there's the, the like, like, you know, these people aren't like, you know, the best in the world just because of just the training. It's their personalities, mindsets and everything like that. And so if you can speak to them, ask certain questions that you can extract some information or knowledge and you can take that away and, and hopefully apply it in your own world. Like so. So it's been great. Um, it's been great to be able to go off to these meets. I was never at Diamond Leagues until this summer. Um, and um, to be around the best in the world, especially right now in a time when middle in distance running, where like it's probably the hottest it's ever been, you know. It, you, you mentioned something there, David, about the personalities of, of each of the runners and kind of the, the mix zones and the and the, the media I've been involved in at races is that's something you become very aware to. You know who to go for if they've had a good result and who to go for not to go for if they had a bad result. Do you know what I mean? And and that's something like and I have a few kind of quick fire questions here on on, on that topic in terms of who maybe through this season, I know you had a great season in terms of broadcasting this year of, of the, the quality and the names of the people you got in your interviews, but maybe who was a little bit more standoffish after one specific race that, that you got an interview with, who, who maybe wasn't as optimistic as, as someone else? Yes, good question. And like this is the, this is part of the skill of, as you know yourself, working in media. You have to be able to read the situation, right? Like, you know, like naturally enough, an athlete is going to be disappointed when they come off. And you can, like, listen, we're there because the athletes are there. The athletes don't need us. We need the athletes exactly. from a media point of view, right? So we have to be, we have to be massively respectful. And that's the approach I bring in. I have 
the utmost respect for everyone out there doing what they're doing. Um, and I'm never looking to to ask questions that aren't of, you know, value or benefit or putting the athlete on the spot because that's just, you know, it's not needed. But, you, you you know, some people like, you know, they all have different personality. They, they will all have a little character change depending on a good run or bad run, you know. Um, like, uh, I suppose it's, you know, it's it's hard to say, like, like yeah, it's, it's interesting. There was like, there was a couple of sprinters all right at times maybe, like you know, after a good race they'd be good, but then after another race they yeah, they they just yeah. wouldn't want to the talk to you. But I personalities, don't they? Yeah, but I suppose my my thing with it is I try to get you know when I do get to the, um, interview these athletes that like I I get to know them like I I do and I I know them off camera as well and when we're at the meets I can go to meets and I can like there at Stockholm Diamond League I did the pre meet with. Uh, uh, Louise Garvala, I did it with uh, Kieran Long, I did it with Sam Parsons, I did it with who else was there? There was there was there was oh George Beamish. Like I'm going doing the war pre meet the day before with these guys. Nothing to do with Sidious, just completely separate because I've gotten to know these guys and I think like they they can see that I'm not in it to to extract you know stupid gossipy or or questions like that. I'm genuinely interested in them. And also, I give them the time, or, or I'm like I'm equally interested to talk to an athlete after they haven't had a good run, you know. And it's funny because I actually um, um, I remember in Oslo. So Kira McGee had a really good run in. Um, it wasn't was it Florence was it Kira was in as well. Yeah, Florence. She had a good run in Florence, really good run. But anyway, she didn't have a great run in Oslo in the Bislett Games in the mile, right? And. Um, you know, she was a little bit disappointed after that. Now I didn't get to I didn't get to interview Pierre after, but the next day we were um we were on the train back to the airport talking and like clearly like, you know, as any athlete is, you know, Kira's it maybe feeling a little bit down and disappointed in her performance. But she knew she was in good shape and she was, you know, like every athlete does at the time when it happens, sometimes you kind of go rooting for answers and that. Um, but sometimes you can have a bad day, you know. But but Kira like then like literally next race out, she comes out and she runs like, you know, PVs in Monaco and PV. so it was cool to see that an athlete even at the highest level can go through a moment of like feeling down have their doubts question themselves in the middle of a season but also then have that ability and strength to kind of pick themselves up and get back in the horse and then look at the season she ended up having so it's cool to be around that to see that so that then on my side whether it's either through my own experience of running or when I'm coaching people I can say like this happens to everyone in the world like one bad race doesn't mean things aren't going well or that like you're human at the end of the day. You can have bad days, and this is natural. And even the best people in the world aren't bulletproof, you know? Of course. And, and there, I think one important point that you touched on there is building that relationship with the athletes is, is so important. And, and not just going to the events to, to get, you know, that, that one line or that one mishap that an athlete has in an interview that you can use as the headline is actually building a solid foundation relationship with these athletes so they'll give you the time of day like you said we need them 100%. they don't need us yeah no 100 percent, man and that's what i like i'm always thinking about like you know the next time i meet this person will they speak to me you know um and and like i, th I think you know you just ask the the, the 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 questions and like you're not rooting for anything and um and you're just be mindful and be respectful of them and, and be thankful they're speaking to you and and I think then it'll go well. And obviously there was moments when I was in the mix zones, I was nervous. Would I say something that I, I, I didn't in, I didn't think about maybe that might come off wrong or something like that? Yeah. Thankfully, that didn't happen. But I also said to myself, look, if that does happen, I'm also human as well. I'm allowed uh, I'm allowed to make mistakes as well. Yeah, no, I don't know if you've seen the interview with Jakob Ingerbits, and I can't remember who, I think, who was interviewing him, but they asked him, um, if if the, he should be if they if he thinks that Diamond League should get rid of the paces so it replicates more um of championship racing and he didn't seem too fond of that question because what he, he followed up with was was that once the the, the pacers drop out he's then the pacemaker because he's at the top yeah. of the race every single time I don't know if you've seen that interview I did I did a court man there's nothing I haven't seen on that man out there <laughs> yeah yeah no and 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 uh, and you know he's because like you know like. Let's be like I know, like you know, you know, Jakob can like like some people can see take it like that that he might be a little bit arrogant or that. But listen, like he is the best in the world, and the times are fast because of him. Like, like I guarantee you this: if he wasn't in the race, who's going to get out behind the pacemaker? Now, the only other fast diamond league this summer was when Josh Kerr took it on, and Josh intentionally went after that. And you know, I was even just you know speaking to Josh briefly after it, like. And, you know, it was he was saying, like, you know, it's world champion. Like, you know, it's it's almost like I 
I, not, not, there's not, you know, every athlete won't have the opportunity in life to, you know, take a diamond league by the scruff of the horns and take it on. And whether it works out or not, like, who cares? But to have that moment in your life, like, you should go for it. Yeah. Um, and, and Josh did, and he made that race fast because of that, you know. But, like, others won't get out at that pace. They rely on, like, like you know, even Yard Yard and the Goose ran the 3, uh, 43 in the mile last week. But, like, sure, he was sitting on Jakob's heels the whole way. Jakob had to lead the last two laps. Now, imagine if Jakob had a pacemaker in till 100 metres to go. Jakob would run 342, 341 probably. Yeah, of course, of course. So, yeah, they have, they have the right to have this personality because they are the ones leading the sport not only the race but they are leading the sport and and they're the athletes that are bringing people like yourself and city of smag to these events so they're they have they, they have the right to maybe you know not want to do an interview or be more a little bit more standoffish because you like you said you guys are there for him and for athletes like him but david i, I, I know this was your first season you know and a huge season for you in terms of uh, the broadcasting side with city of smag as as time goes on, will you be willing to stir the pot a little bit more? I, I know between Josh Kerr and Jakob Ingebrigtsen, there was a bit of rivalry there during Budapest. Some some things are said in press conferences and interviews. Will you be you know willing to stir the pot a little bit more to, to kind of drive them rivalries on? No, because I don't need to drive those rivalries on, man. Those guys are they, those guys don't need media people to drive their rivalries on. They are they want to be the best. So we don't you know um and like. You know, I talk to Josh and his own separate, and I talk to Jakob and his separate. And like, it's not about oh Josh and Jakob; it's about everyone in the field out there. Also, is a threat, you know. Um, so no, um, I will never be stirring the pot because that's not my interest, man. Um, you know, it's not it's not what I'm about. Um, and I have too much respect for those athletes to do that. I have the same amount of respect for both Jakob and Josh. Um, and and you know, so there's no need to. There's no like I don't need to create the rivalry. They, they create the rivalry themselves. You know what I mean? And 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 uh, and uh, yeah. And like you know, at the end of the day too, like you know, it's easy to kind of you know, Jakob obviously comes off the track after the Europe, uh, the Worlds, and naturally he's disappointed as anyone would be, and we see that with many other athletes. So he, he's allowed to say something that maybe he mightn't say tomorrow. You know what I mean? And 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 we're not going to judge him on every word. Like. Uh, I know I can say things at, at one stage and I kind of might look back 10 minutes later and I was like, oh, actually, I didn't really mean that. Like, you know, we're all human at the end of the day. So, um, no, I will be promoting and building those athletes. Definitely not uh, trying to stir the pot. <laughs> yeah, because we, we are out the reporters, really, the, their performances on the track build them rivalries on, on, on their own. Yeah, man, they're they're two animals. They're, 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 both of them see each other as the alpha. They, both of them see themselves as the alphas. You know, Jakob sees himself as the king of the jungle and Josh... You know, Josh is, you know, won the world championships now, but like he probably wants to become even more undisputed against Jakob. So both of those guys think they're the they're the line and 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 you know, so they don't need anyone to say that for them. They like there's no media people on them when they're grafting and grinding all year round. So, you know, they're highly motivated to be the best as it is. Of course, of course. And uh, David, I, I seen your uh, interview with the City is Mad guys with Jake Whiteman over the course of, of um, the World Championships in Budapest, which is really, really interesting what he had to say about, you know, Jakob Ingebrigtsen and, and him taking him down in Oregon last year. Um, n you know, the next World Championships, obviously the Olympics is, is looking to, in terms of 1500 meter running, is looking to be really, really stacked. But then the World Championships then the year after, hopefully with, with Jake, Jakob and uh, Josh Kerr in it, is looking to be really, really strong with the confidence Jake had, although being injured this season, the confidence he had in that interview with you guys it, with City of Smag, it's looking to be a really, really strong competition. Yeah, man. I mean, like, it's, it's you know, you this summer was so good, you kind of wonder, like, oh, will it live up to it again? But when you think about, like, these boys are only getting started. Like, Jake is back in the mix next year. Like, um, you know, Josh is Josh is just getting better and better. And you must remember, Jakob's only 22, man. Jakob is years ahead of him. And Jakob is not stopping, man, till he gets... Well, I don't know if you heard he, the, his interview after he won the 3K there at Pre-Classic the other day. I mean, he wants to go run, break the world record in the marathon. So if that's the case, he's going to be around a long time. <laughs> yeah. And obviously, he wants to get that world 1,500-meter title. It's the only title he doesn't have, um, you know. And, uh, and he, he needs to have that for himself. Um, you know, um, so he's going to be motivated to keep going from that. Though. So interviews I listened to him over the weekend, it doesn't seem like he's stopping anytime soon. Um, and I don't think any, any of the others will. And there's a load of people there like, oh, you know, Ollie, Ollie, uh, Ollie Hoare, like um, who um, 
who wasn't even in the championships this year. Another one of the on guys who's running really well was injured. He might be back in the back in the in the mix um, uh, next year as well. Like you know, on top of them having Yard Nagus, Yard Nagus only starting out. Like he's going to keep getting better and better. You know, so so there, and there, there's many more. Like right now, man, the 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 the, the fields are absolutely stacked anyway. Um, so it's going it's going to be just really exciting next year. Olympics and even World Indoors will be on as well. So there'll be a nice little something to look forward to in the in the short term. And then obviously even just all the Diamond League series are are, are great as well. So yeah, man. So it 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 it, it definitely um, will bring a lot of interest and a lot of following around middle distance running going into the Olympic year. And then whatever way that turns out next year, we'll set up the, for the following year, for the, for the year to come after that 2025 for uh, the world championships. Definitely. definitely. It's, you, you had obviously your interview um, with Jakob Ingebrigtsen, um, which is a, a scary thing to, to, to do because actually for the uh, European cross country championships here in Dublin, um, my club was like the club bringing the athletes from the airports to their hotel and I got to actually um, bring Jakob and his dad to to their car, and I I was I I put a microphone in 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 Jakob's face. Now I I it took me a while to to build up the courage. I think we went from terminal two to terminal one where his car was, and like half. Of the and you're just in your you're you're just to, to yourself. Your mic, come on, come on, dude, yeah. come on, get the moment going, come on, come on. Yeah, yeah, of course, man. Down, of course, because you know he he has the, obviously the right to the build up to a big race. At that year in in Dublin was. The, his first senior European um, cross country yeah. title, so you know he's trying to stay calm and, and stay in the zone. So he has the full right to turn down an interview, and of course, some someone like myself who was just there with a phone. Um, but he was he was open to it. Tell us about your experience interviewing Jakob, because like you just said, you you are in your own head. Like, come on, come on, just do it. He's just a person. You know what I mean? Yeah, and I was exactly like that too, man. Absolutely uh, shitting my pants, uh, you know, sweating, man. I was sweating beforehand, um, but at the same time too, I wanted to do it. And like that, I had my doubts, but I was like, but look, like, you know, uh, you miss 100% of the shots you don't take, you know what I mean? So like, there was nothing to lose because if you don't, as, as you always say, if you don't ask, the answer is no. So it's no either way then, you know. Um, but uh, I was just amazed, and you can see it this summer too. He... Talk like he Norwegians also too. You must remember too. There's a, there can be kind of culture difference with people, you know. Like he's very he kind of takes his time to ask questions, and sometimes you think he's just going to stop and not answer, but he actually thinks about what he's going to say. Um, and man, he speaks like you know that interview with him. Like I was only supposed to be in the mix zone. You're allowed max like two minutes. I got like nearly like eight minutes out of him, and it was a massive interview in terms of like I feel the information he gave, and I think that interview went quite viral with him. Like you know, and I I I honestly believe that interview set up a lot of people to be feel more brave and know what to ask them. Other other media people throughout the summer going forward, because I think some of the best interviews with Jacob have been this summer. And I think they've all come off the back of the one I got with him in Paris, which is great because people see that he's open to talking and he will talk. Um, and I, I think he's very passionate about the sport. He's very knowledgeable, like, you know, um, and I think, you know, you ask him the right questions. I think he'll talk away to you all day. No, definitely it's it is it, it is a thing of you kind of getting over that initial fear maybe next time you go to interview him you mightn't be quite as nervous and um, obviously I, I listened to your podcast on on the cork diaries and you your tactic yourself was to go a little bit further down the line in in the mix zone and and then when he's kind of done with with the main crowd i suppose because people like to crowd up to throw their microphones in he'll he'll give you a moment just like okay the last guy i'll give him a sec and as as you get into the interview he doesn't kind of cut you off then that was your, your tactic in terms of getting the interview with Jakob. yeah definitely man like i i really wanted to have that like you know it's like you know as like i you're you're always competitive with yourself right so like i was like how sick would it be if i could get a really good interview with Jakob here like and this and is my moment right? like you know, and uh, and and I could see it was all crowded, and I was just like, oh, I'm just not going to get in there. I want I want like a proper one on one with him. Um, so yeah, I just went to the right end, and I just took the chance that like, although he might be like tired from talking, you know, he might give me this last one, and then at least I won't have many people around me. Um, and um, yeah, man, it just worked that way. And you know, you always got to think about you. You know, when they say like social, you're doing social media stuff, or you're trying to grab the attention of people, you need a hook, like a hook. And so you're so how you open up is always like um, is always important because like they don't know you then. Now he knows me. Like I got another interview off him 
in Oslo at Bislett Games. So he's aware of me, same the ones I did with Carson Warholm. They're aware of you then. So then you have a better chance of getting more after that, you know, and especially like if they if they're if they're interviews that they like doing, then they they'll come to you, you know. And they also see that as part of their responsibility as athletes as well anyway, like, you know. Um but yeah, so it was it was it was quite nerve wracking. But then when I got it it was some buzz man and um, you know, when I go into these interviews, I'm like, I just think about like if I was going out for a run with Jacob and I was chatting with him, like what would we talk about and what would I want to know? And, and, and that's the way it goes. Is, is, is the stuff outside of just the tactics for that race, you know what I mean? It's it's the yeah. more organic stuff that people at home listening actually want to hear. And um, of course, yeah. people, you want to get the breakdown of the race as well. But then, you know, once all that's said and done, it's him as a person rather than just him as an athlete. And that is yeah. a lot of what people want to hear. Yeah, because the race is the end result. I want to know how did he get to the end result. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then when, when you sent that off um, to, to the guys and in City of Mag, what was the reaction like on, on their end with, with such a... Oh, sure, they, yeah, they were, yeah, they were buzzing, man. Like, so, you know, the way we worked it in the mix zone, I'm like, um, like, I upload the video, so I log into the um, Sidious YouTube channel and then I upload it and then I upload it, but it's on private and then one of the the lads over there does the editing on it and that. So, yeah, sure, look, man, it, it, it was, it was they were buzzing with it. It was class, um, you know, to get that amount of time and then not only to get that interview and the time, but actually the, the quality of the interview was really good. So, yeah, sure, they, I think they they were, I suppose, uh, equally happy with me this summer because, you know, I feel like I did the job as, 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 as uh, you know, probably better than what they even expected so um which is cool um and it's always satisfying for me to be able to do a job very well um and you know that in return hopefully brings more opportunities definitely and on, on the topic of opportunities for you david whether it's next season or, or down the line through your career with city of smag or your broadcasting career as a whole who's kind of the number one guy that, that you want to get now that you've gotten Jakob? You know, and of course, as the races go on, you want to keep getting Jakob as, as time goes on. But down the line, who who's the one still on the on the bucket list for yourself? To be honest, man, it was Jakob was the one on the bucket list. Like, I mean, I got Josh Kerr this summer. I got Jared Nagus. I got like, you know, I, I got I got I got everyone I wanted to get, you know. Yeah. Um, and then even because Jake wasn't there, but I I I I, I uh, we had to sit down with Jake, you know, at the at the uh, World Championships. Um, so um. Uh, Obviously, I've never I've never spoken to Kipchoge. You know, he's not on the track right now. You know, so he's a guy. Um, but um, I I do think though with Kipchoge, he kind of because of he's the, he's the way he is and the way he thinks, he speaks a lot in riddles. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know, so so I don't think you're going to get the training information or specific things about him. He, he's his mindset is at a philosophical philosophical level that like sometimes it's hard to kind of really pinpoint okay how do i go away and implement this you know um Keep but um more of a sit down kind of conversation i know the guys on city is mag have, have got to experience yeah but, but for yourself personally i think chip Chogi, like you said he is a sit down conversation so you can you yourself although you know the athletes need to process the question you're asking with Kipchoge, it seems like you need to be able to process the answers that he's given. It's not as such as black and white as as some, yeah. of, the, some of the post race interviews. Yeah, no, definitely, man, definitely, and yeah, and and so Kipchoge be one. Also, I've, I've I've a lot of interest on the coaching side, so there's plenty of coaches out there I'd like to interview going forward as well, and 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 ask questions about. So yeah, so we'll see. Maybe you know we'll, we'll see how they develop, but like it's just about putting yourself in the position, and in and, and you know you you get a bit lucky and at the right place, right time, and you know it was a very good summer for me. You know it was a, hopefully it wasn't just beginner's luck. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, with the way the interviews went, and and like you said, the the relationships that you've built with the athletes over such a short period of time, because athletics moves so quickly, it's onto the next race, onto the next race, and the athletes yeah. are kind of forgetting about the interviews but the relationships that you seem to build with a lot of these athletes it looks like it's it's going to stand for for a long time and really contribute to to your broadcast and career i suppose yeah no definitely man and like like with a lot of those athletes now like you know even if like i, I i'm friends with them that like you know i can i can message them one-on-one -on, -one on instagram because we become mates with them yeah. like you know and and, I, and and like you know I, first and foremost i'm interested in 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 the sport and 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 running and um you know, like I have, like for me, I respect for every athlete out there at any level or that because I know how difficult the sport is, and and then to be, even be that good, like you know, um, even if you're not the best in the world, if you're making world championships or world championship finals, that's a massive uh, achievement in itself. 
Um, and uh, yeah, man, and, and just to be around them and like to be, it's, a, it's an honor to be able to go when you're at these Diamond Leagues, go out and runs with them and chat with them and get to know them. So like, you know, when they see you, they know you and, and that's, that's a good buzz, man. Definitely, definitely. And in terms of the, the coaching side of your, you know, your interviews, um, I heard that you also got uh, to build up a nice little relationship as well with Gert Ingerbrickson. Um, tell us a little bit about that story. Yeah, so um, that was at the on track night in Paris. Um, I saw the guy who won the race, Narva, who I, that was my first time seeing him or knowing of him. And I was like, who is this guy from Norway? And I had heard he was coached by Gert. And then I'd seen Gert or I'd seen Gert in the distance that night. I was like, what's he doing here? And that was exactly the night after the Paris Diamond League. But anyway, as I, I, I kind of went for a walk around and like yourself plucking up the courage to interview Jakob. Um, I saw Gert and he was over in the he was over in the warm up field there and he was standing by a gear bag which must have been nervous as he was off either doing a post workout session or something like that and Gert was on his phone and so I just went over yeah and I started chat I said I was you know walking around hovering around like a little fanboy but not having the courage to go up and I said to myself do you know what Dave I said forget about the camera now forget about the interview I says like you'd go and talk to this guy regardless because you want to so that's what I did I went over first and I just said hey Gert I was like geez great run by Narva like you know some improvements there and just generally started chatting like that man and he bought into it and led and then I was like hey Gert do you mind if I interview you I'm actually working with Sidious Mag and I explained he's like yeah sure no problem and it, it 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 went from there. And again, very like Jakob, you have that you before you know them, you think they're not open to chatting, but then when you talk about running, which is also their life, man, like their life is running, their life is that. And not only just from a competitive side of view, but they are very much into the process, the training, which I'm into as well. And so they can go deep into that, and I really enjoy that. Yeah, because. Uh, you know, on on the surface, um, he, he can he can look like a a really kind of not maybe not so approachable Cold. character. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but when 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 you do break it down to kind of the the basics of it, they are just people. You no, know, like you said, yeah. As if you're just standing there beside uh, Narva Nordas's gear bag, just pr- yeah. like you said, probably just flicking through his phone and um, seeing what people had to say about the race. So when you break it down to that scale, they are are just people. Do you know what I mean? Facts. Yeah, definitely, man. Definitely, yeah. But um, no, and, and Narva Nordas uh, himself had had a great, great season as well. The Norwegian middle distance scene, um, and the World Championships as well this year had a really, really um strong turnout. Obviously, Nordas got bronze, and then being trained by Jakob Ingebrigtsen's dad and ex coach as well is something that you know caused a lot of immediate attention towards that side of of the Norwegian. Athletics this year, not only Jakob Ingebrigtsen, which was great to see as well. Yeah, no, definitely, man. Like Nordis, I'd say probably you have to give him the gold medal for our biggest breakthrough of 2023. Like, um, I don't know if you checked out his Instagram post there he put up yesterday, but he just broke down all his improvements and what he achieved throughout the year, and um, it was it's unbelievable. Um, but uh, yeah, like, and you know, obviously, then that creates you know again, it, it, there's a rivalry anyway between people. Like, there's a, you know, they're the two top. Uh, you know people in Norway um, and obviously you know now now Narva being coached by Jakob's dad and obviously you know um, you know they're not working together at least on a professional level anymore Jakob and, and Gert so I suppose there there's a bit of fuel in the fire for someone like Narva there and then you know to almost like see can his dad his, Jakob's dad help him beat Jakob you know and yeah. if that works for Narva then all the, all the better man you know definitely definitely you know it's um it, it, the game's the game at the end of the day, and if it gets you the gold right. medal uh, 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 at the end of the race, well, th- that's all you can ask for, I suppose. Um, but it's a really interesting storyline, and seeing um, uh, Narvan Ardos getting the bronze this year with a breakthrough season, it'll be interesting to see his rivalry with Jakob Ingebrigtsen grow over Paris and then in 2025, the World Championships, and possibly even the indoors uh, World Championships then um, with with the coming year as well. So that is another side of distance running that will be really interesting to uh, to keep your eye on as well. Definitely, yeah. No, no, definitely. Um, David, you, you mentioned there that you, you have an interest in, in the coaching side of things as well. So your, your broadcasting and interviewing um, will, will definitely lead that way as well. But for you personally as a coach, Take us from when kind of your your running at such a high level came down a couple of notches and you started leading into the coaching lifestyle. Yeah, so 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 like you know, I always had that interest, like you know, from my own side, and you know, figuring out so whether it was when I was in college in America, you know, uh, buying books online again. There was no social media side, you know, so 
um, you know, buying books on likes of, you know, Jack Daniels, Arthur Lydiard and, and, and breaking down, you know, some of the world renowned coaches at that time, you know, and, uh, and what does it take to be a better athlete? Like, you know, I definitely felt that like I didn't reach my potential and I, I, I want to like know why. And then, you know, can I, can I, you know, through my learnings of, you know, what didn't, didn't work. And then through my learning of coaching and looking back in hindsight, um, you know, what could I, what could I do now to make things better? And, you know, like, if I can coach an athlete now and bring them on and to new levels in that, uh, in a, in a training style that I didn't do, at least it gives me some sort of redemption on like my own running career, knowing that like, well, at the end of the day, like you can be, have all the talent in the world, but you still have to be in the, you still have to be doing the right training, like, you know? Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, so that developed the interest there. So I always had the interest in, in, in the training side of things. And then, like, you know, like I said, like, I, I, I'm just a, fa- a fan of the sport. And so when I stopped running in 2016, I also then ended up, I was go- I'm good friends with Steve Macklin, who was uh, based in Cork at the time. And he was coaching the likes of Darren McElhenney, Michal Power, all of these guys. And I used to just go up and while I was, like, not competitively running anymore, I'd, I'd just jump in on the workouts. And at the time when Dara wasn't as fast as he, as he is now, I was able to help, I was able to ha- help pace Dara in workouts. And so I got to know the lads through all that. And I spent a, a couple of years doing that, going out in Portugal training camps and all of that. And then, you know, um, and, then, uh, and then I was always coaching a few athletes on the side myself, even from when I was in college, just if people were, you know, just asking me. So always, I always had my hand in it, even though I mightn't have said I was coaching. And uh, so anyway, when Steve Matten then ended up getting the job in Qatar, and obviously he was leaving the lads, um, you know, he, I suppose he felt, he felt, you know, he knew like, you know, I obviously I had the knowledge background of the sport um, from him just knowing me anyway. And he saw how I interacted with the lads and, and, and I knew them as people. I think he probably felt like, you know, I was probably the next best fit for, for, for those boys when he leaves. And at least he's put, he felt he was putting them in good hands and in a, and, and staying to a similar philosophy system so that their, most importantly, their running career could keep developing. Um, and uh, so he asked me at the time, and obviously, like, I was like, at the start, I was like, you know, obviously, this is a class, but at, at the same time, too, knowing Steve and, and how hard a worker he is and the time he puts in and then knowing how committed these lads are, you can't just decide to take that on and you know without you know really thinking about like what this this commitment is for me and responsibility is for me um but i thought this is my opportunity this is my this is my uh, golden ticket here you know to to be to 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 have a, a group of athletes who are passionate about running who are talented and who are at a level that can really rock on to higher levels and so so I started coaching the lads, um, you know, but I was like, although it might have been the start of my coaching career for me, it, it, I, it wasn't like I didn't feel like a newbie. I knew exactly what needed to be done. I knew how I was going to plan out the training, plan the year. And and that first year with them, like, you know, Michal Power, Evan Byrne, not 30 seconds after 5 KPV, they both went from like basically 1430 down to 14 minutes. Um, that cross country season, Michal Power, Dara and Laura Nicholson made the Euro cross. That indoor season, Dara broke the national indoor 5,000 meter record, which was held by John Tracy, which was then also secured his qualifying time for that summer outdoor five uh, European championships. And then that outdoor season, you know, like Michal had such a good run at Belgium that night. Um, he ran 14.02. Dara ran tw- uh, 13, 50 something to break the national outdoor junior record. And then later that summer, Dara broke the national outdoor 3000 meter record in Watford. And then he went on and he medaled at the European juniors in the 3000. Um, and then Michal made the European under 23. So we, it was a massive year. Like it couldn't have gone any better. Um, and uh, so, so that was a lot of fun. Um, and then it was just cool to be part of those guys, um, you know, continuous development. But then off the back of that, I obviously I got the opportunity to go out to Qatar coaching. And, um, you know, that was too good of an opportunity to turn down. And, you know, especially from a point of view where like now I'm actually can call this my job because I'm actually getting paid to do it. And, you know, so like that, that's part of my coaching journey that I had to go do. And, um, you know, it, it, it was tough. I must say it was tough because I look back in 2019 coaching those lads, like all of us, I think not only was it a successful year, but we just had so much fun. Uh, and I really do think that was a big part of the success. And, you know, probably if I didn't ever end up going to Qatar, I'd probably be still coaching all those boys to this day, unless some of them went, ended up going to the States or something like that, you know. Um, but that's the way it goes. And, you know, thankfully, all of those guys, we were able to kind of line them up with 
with good coaches and you know pe- put them into the good hands of people and 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 every one of those lads have now continuously excelled and are running well and and then my coaching career went out to Qatar and um you know I got to experience working in the Spire Academy which is a big high performance facility largest indoor sports facility in the world with all the top science stuff and everything like that but unfortunately my experience out there was covid so like everything in the world everything shut down no competitions no nothing like that so it was tough and then at the time um my wife who i'm not married to now uh because border shut down and she was from argentina we didn't get to see each other for like 13 months and long story short um i really loved my time out there but it just wasn't coming together like i wanted it to and so I made the decision to move back to Ireland here. And, um, you know, before I went to Qatar, I, I got my teaching qualification. So I'm a qualified secondary school teacher in Ireland. So I always had that to be able to rely on, you know, even if, the, if you know, my own running ended someday or, or the coaching, you know, you, you know, in Ireland, you're not really earning, a, you know, a living from coaching as such. You know, it can be a side little hustle on the side. Um, and, uh, you know, from a financial aspect, you know, because like, obviously at this stage in my life, like, you know, you, you know, I love coaching and it's passion, but you, you have to figure out a way of how to earn. And, but so thankfully enough, like, you know, I came back and I, while I was doing substitute teaching and all of that, and uh, last year, I, over the last two, three years, I, I, I worked on kind of building my own platform of coach and, you know, and putting myself out there as a coach so that like, you know, I, I could try and make this a full time thing going forward. And and that's mostly what I'm doing now. I am coaching full time now and I have a lot of athletes. And, you know, it's 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 not maybe on the side of where like it's all Darren McElhenney's me all powers. But that, I'm I, I'm I, I'm just as motivated to coach anyone who wants to get better, no matter if they're a beginner coming in for the first time, a club level runner, not even a club level runner, a road level runner or national or international level. So. I like to think, you know, my running knowledge can, is applicable to everyone. Like, you know, it's not as if you have a knowledge that only works with elites and doesn't work with beginners. You know, I, I've coached young kids all the way through to senior athletes. So and 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 through that, those whole processes each year, I'm also learning um, and continuously learning. So. So, yeah. So for me, like I, I, I love I get such a buzz out of helping people get better. I love seeing people kind of almost my passion fall onto them. And I think then that's what's the biggest thing for them when they get that. It just gives them an, an, a new energy for the sport. And um, and just being able to kind of share my experiences with people. And then, you know, like I said, from what worked well or what didn't work well in my running that I can bring to people's running now. And like, you know, I was in Copenhagen there the weekend um, and, uh, you know, I had a, 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 a lad I'm coaching, um, you know, uh, and he only came to me about a year and a half ago and he came to me with a half marathon PB of like 150. And um, in a few months, we brought it down to, you know, 142. And then in April this year, he went down to 133. And then in Copenhagen this weekend, he ran 126. So he's he's after knocking close to half an hour off his half marathon time. So like that's it. That's like you know, and 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 the guy's you know whole uh, you know physique has changed, and you know and 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 every and it's just so cool to see those transformations. And those transformations can happen for anyone, but a lot of people have this stigma about that. Like you have to be good at running to be good at running, but you don't. Like you know, the the elites are good at running and at that level because they were in it from day one. You just need time. And unfortunately, like the thing about running is it's not necessarily skill based, where you can go out and learn a skill quickly. Like. It takes time to change the physiology of the body. It takes time to develop the heart and lungs, for also the muscle side of things. Um, like you, you can't just jump into heavy training straight away. You have to build up your load. So you have to be patient with it. So there is no shortcut. Like, like there, there is no shortcut to running. Like when I look back in Cahill's training up to the point of now where he ran 26, there was no way I could have fast tracked that any sooner. It took this amount of time. Um, and now hopefully he keeps going. We'll get him down below 180 in next year. Um, so... So yeah, so like I get a buzz off anyone who wants to run, and 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 I love working with people who are who are um, enthusiastic and, and committed to it, um, because it's all about the process and it's about just knowing that it is a long term game, but you're always getting short term goals along the way because it's not as if you're sitting, it's not as if you're doing all the training. There's no improvement in fitness, and then overnight you become a su- superstar. No, you don't. Like if your PB is is 410 in the mile and you you want to run uh sub four like you know you chip away at that now or, or somebody who's 430 in a mile who wants to be four minute mile or you'll chip away at that over time you know it's not as if you're staying at 430 and you automatically become four minutes overnight like you chip away chip away and if you see yourself as you know consistently chipping away what's to stop you from consistent continues to chip away and when it comes to building the aerobic system 
more so than speed, speed, you know, specific, you know, turnover. Like I was never the fastest kicker in the field, but like when it comes to developing endurance, there is really no limit to that. If the training is done right and, you know, you know what you're doing, like you can keep building fitness forever, like, you know, um, so there's no end to that. Um, it's just a matter of how you do it, I think, you know. T- t- tell us a little bit about that that consistency, I suppose, because when you when you took over and started training, you know, and coaching Darren McHenney and all 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 the, them great athletes at, at such a young age, that consistency c- can be hard. And for maybe y- younger athletes, especially listening in now, that consistency, like you said, there's really no limit once once you're consistent. But then obviously there's barriers like like injuries, for example, and especially for young athletes, that can be really disheartened when when you see your peers you know go pushing on and and doing really really great things and and you're kind of stuck to the sideline so so talk talk to us a little bit about that consistency and and how you implemented that into when you took over training someone like Darren McElhenney who who's now gone on to do great things yeah well lucky enough Dara has been very consistent since he began running you know he's been lucky he really hasn't had uh, too many injuries or stuff like that and like I said he was in the hands of Steve Macklin before me so Steve had laid that foundation but I think it's it's a, it's the it's the perspective you look at things right so I think what catches people and I've said this in other podcasts before is they get caught up in the next race right they get caught up in like if you have a bad track season oh I'm going to now you know make Euro cross or if you have a bad Euro cross I'm going to smash indoors but like you're always going to be racing, right? Like, so I think what people need to shift the focus to is the process, the long-term development. So like, like you know, like what can I start doing now? So like that's what Jakob Ingebrigtsen has done. He's the, he's focused on the process, the training, getting that right, finding a training load that he can handle, be consistent with, and progress and develop over time. And then he takes the races in his stride because the races and the race results are a byproduct of the training. Okay. And so you need to focus on you, yourself and your journey. So like Michal Power was not as fast as Dara when he was younger, but Michal Power closed the gap in as he got older, running now like 13, 29 and stuff, you know. So so like everyone's journey is different. Everyone has started in the sport differently. So you got to focus on yourself. And like if you're always looking at somebody else, like, well, sure, like if you're looking at me in a race, if we're out racing, Killian, you're looking at me. I was like, well, sure, Killian, you might as well look at everyone else because there's a lot more people out there can beat you than me, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, so focus on like, all you need to do is like, like you can't be like, all anyone wants to do is get better. Right. And that inevitably will end up hopefully start helping you beat people. Right. But if you focus on you getting better, you'll inevitably beat people that you didn't beat before out in the track. But you've got to focus on the process. So it's it's getting the foundations of, of, of your training right, finding a training load that's one like, you know, you know, you're building, you know, like aspects kids need to be working on, like the mechanics, the strength and conditioning. Like there has to be some sort of strength and conditioning in your program from a young age so that you're bringing it through because we know this is part of it. We also know part of it is is you know, whatever training load mileage you're at now, okay, it's different for every individual, no matter what age you are. So if you're 16, there's a lot of different 16 year olds out there running different volumes, but you got to figure out this is where I am now and how can I progress it? And you got to look at like, what does it usually take to run a, a 13, 35K and what are athletes usually running? Okay, well, it'll take me over the years. If I want to do this over five years, you know, my training load needs to go to here. So I need to be doing, you know, whether it's this amount of threshold workouts or I need to be doing this amount of volume. And then you need to progress it to that. And you need to have an idea of like where not only is the end goal of your training, your your goal race result, you need to know, well, what would be the correlation training plan to that result? And so you've got to be, you've got to be mindful of that. But that's obviously in the hands of the coach. You know what I mean? So like an athlete can't predict that. So then it's also important that the athletes know that the system they're in is something that is, you know, has that mindset of like long term development. And a lot of maybe coaches can speak about long term development because it's an easy word to, to throw out there. But is it seen in the training plan? Like that has to be there or at least the coach should be able to speak with the athlete of like where they're going. So when I'm coaching athletes like. I always say, like, here where we are now, but this is where we'd be looking to go to. So that gives the athlete a lot of confidence in what they're doing now, knowing that they're also building. So I really keep the focus on the process. And that then keeps them engaged and motivated every day. And it's always one day at a time, as opposed to if you just keep it all on one race and then that race goes bad, then the athlete gets unmotivated, they get disheartened, they drop the head. Where if you keep it on the process, even if you get injured as an athlete, we're like, yeah, but we get in the gym. That's part and 
parcel of, of being an athlete, you're going to get injured. You know, Jake Whiteman got injured this year. This is inevitable part of the sport, but it's how you act and how you behave during those times, it, you know, minimizes the, the longer ne- term negative effect of injuries. So like, OK, we got injured. Well, maybe we have a weakness here. Let's get into the gym and start working on that or let's get on the cross trainer. I always say for young athletes who get injured cross training, they can probably accumulate more time um, cross training than they, they can out running. So maybe most kids, their daily run is a five or six mile run, which might be 35 to 40 minutes. But if you reduce the impact and you jump into cross trainer, you can actually work the heart and lungs for an hour. And like now I'm saying, well, now your overall time you spend training in the weed is actually even more. So there's a positive we can work on, you know. Um, and so there's so many aspects to like to developing you uh, an athlete to getting to their potential. You know, so there's always that the process, the focus should be on the process. But again, it's part of the athlete and their coach and their team who they're working with to develop that. And I think when the focus is on the process, the athlete is always motivated because they see that it's just about them and themselves and, and where they're working to. David, t- talk us through a little bit of a long term plan, because especially for young athletes, it's about you know, the longevity of that athlete and the more consistent training you do, the better you'll get compared to maybe a, a not so, you know, long term focus plan and, and, and what, what them training sessions or what that plan looks like in, in from a, a long term point of view to a, a very focused and getting bogged down on, on the one race and the next race compared to just the process itself. Yeah, well, I suppose look, it's it's hard to start. It's you can't start calling kind of specific workouts because then, like you know, it's so individualized. So one, you have to look at where the athlete is and uh, right now in front of you. So like like every athlete is different, you know. Um, but like, look, if we're talking, you know, being an endurance athlete, like obviously the name of the game is endurance. So we have to be developing the aerobic system. So that's for, first and foremost. So like, you know, when they talk about the quality, quantity, speed versus, you know, endurance, like you can't deny the fact that the sport is endurance. So you have to be working on building the aerobic capacity. So that's built through, you know, obviously your overall volume week of mileage and where you are now and where you build that towards. So like if some, if, if a kid is young, their long run might be eight miles at some point in the next year it might be 10 miles and then 12 miles and then maybe if they're doing a threshold workout their threshold workout might be a total volume of 20 minutes or 6k and maybe in time we're building that up to 8k or 30 minutes of work um, and it's laying down a prince laying down a, like i always say the, 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 the athletics calendar is the same every year it's like you know it starts it's always the same cross country indoors outdoors like you know what it is so you, you lay out a training plan that you think hits all the principles of training. And then you try and build on that each year. You know, you try and build on that each year. But you must also know that, like, it's very easy. Any athlete, like, you know, when, OK, there's the, this word they talk about threshold and training. But besides that, you know, and you talk about every athlete's threshold. But we all have what I call as well a training threshold. And what that means is basically like an athlete can go out, right? Like I could go out today and run 100 miles this week, right? But like, am I going to really absorb all of that? Like, is my body in a place that it's actually ready to uh, take on 100 miles a week? Probably not. Right now, for me, it's probably 70 to 80. I could go over that, but like, then I got to ask myself, am I absorbing that? So you got to figure out like where you are as a young kid. Like, like you know, if you're, if you're, you got to look at where you're at and build from there. So there's no point coming in and um, and being at 40k and say, oh, I'm going to go do 80k this year. Yeah. And like, it's like, well, like, well, sure, like. Well, you won't absorb the, that and then you're running the risk of getting injured. But let's say even if you didn't get injured, it's just too much. Your energy, you're, you're, you're spending too much energy. And at the end of the day, like three months, three months of, of 80 miles is not as good as six months. Uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, six months of 80K is not as good as, uh, as you know, two years of you know, 50K or three months of three months of 80K is not as good as six months of 60K, right? So it's frequency you want to be building up. So even before you're looking at overall volume, you got to ask yourself, okay, well, like, you know, te- technically every senior athlete is running, you know, at least six days in the week. So maybe one rest day. But if you're only running three days a week, okay, we need to figure out how we can increase the frequency of your running to four days, five days. And so on from there, like, you know, so that's how you look at it and break it down and, and, and progress it forward, you know. And I like to speak about that with the athletes I'm coaching because it really then gives them an idea of where they're working towards and then makes them feel happy about like, yes, at some point I'll probably be at that 
higher volume of training I'm doing. But right now, like that's all stepping stones to it, you know. And and I the way I say it is that like, well, once you're progressing and PBing as it is, we know we're on the right track, you know. Definitely, I think uh, for for some athletes, it, it can be maybe like an ego thing as well. It's it's not for some athletes or an ego thing. Essentially, it's a you know people themselves kind of hold themselves to can hold themselves to a high standard and you know if they see someone else off doing 100 kilometers one, you know one week and they're only doing 40 50 kilometers you know they, they'll they'll think oh i need to get up to at least 60 70 and then they do get a, a end up getting injured so they need to you know it, like you said it's longevity and, and playing it smart that way 100 percent killian and you hit the you hit, you hit the hammer on the nail there by saying it it's ego man it's watching it's the instagrams watching what this guy is doing and thinking you can go out and implement a session it's and that's what it is they're watching others and they're acting out of they're they're acting out of sort of uh, uh they're they're responding you know they're reacting they're reacting yeah, yeah. to somebody else's thing as opposed to having their own plan and so get in your own lane focus on yourself Stop focusing on, and that's the problem, you know, you go to secondary school or you go to college and you have all your friends around and somebody's running well and everyone sees the attention they're getting and now everyone sees Instagram gives attention. But forget that shit, man. Like, just focus on your own process. You know, focus on you. Jakob Britson focuses on himself. All the best people out there are focusing on themselves. As they say, man, winners think about winning. Losers think about winners. Yes, yes, exactly. And, and running, because it's such an easy sport to measure performance, it's it's it, it really does you know it's so easy to compare yourself to 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 other people who are posting on things like strava and, and instagram but you, your your thoughts david really quickly just on on cross training throughout the season like again kind of going back to that ego thing of view of a hard session one day and you wake up the next morning your legs are sore your legs are stiff and on on the agenda you have a, a 10 a 10k run let, let's say or a 10 mile run but your leg, you know, in your head, your legs aren't up for it. But you know, your you, your kind of ego won't let you not do the run. Implementing cross training on the cross trainer on the bike or something like that, or on the rower, and maybe to get some sort of recovery, but kind of stimulating the the cardio system at the same time. Is that something that you'd stand by throughout the season? You know, no matter really what stage of the season that you're in. Yeah, one hundred percent. Because again, I always say like you don't sacrifice your overall development because of one season, right? So just because track season comes, if you start dropping all your mileage or your, your overall you know, volume of training in the week, you're, you're missing time, especially as a young kid. So like you could be on, like, like I said before, like, like if you can get on the cross trainer for an hour, you're working the heart and lungs for an hour versus going out for a 30 minute run. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and so like you're constantly developing the endurance, the capacity, the endurance capacity. And like, as well as that, like if you, you know, like you said there, like, you know, you're, you're not feeling good and you know in your heart and soul you shouldn't be going out running or you've got a sickness or a cold. Like the, the long, the, the knock on effect of that is probably more detrimental than taking that one day off. And like it's inevitable, man. It's part of the sport. So, uh, you know, it, part of the sport is getting injured and part of life is getting sick. You're going to pick yeah. up sicknesses. So you've got to know that you've got to say to yourself, like, in my mind, I'm like, when this stuff comes, I nip it in the bud. And the only way to nip it in the bud is to address it straight away. So minimize, minimize the actual damage this has done. So if you're tired, if you take a rest day, you'll probably be good the next day. If you have a cold and you rest, it's not going to affect your training going forward. If you have an injury and you get to the bottom of it, it's not going to be prolonged. Because I also believe when you're training and you're not in a good headspace, if you're injured or that, and you're not really buzzing with it, I don't think even the training absorbs because you're a little bit kind of worried and anxious about what's going on. We're like, focus on it, you know, and, and just always ask yourself, am I making the right moves? Am I smart? And like, you'll be rewarded for that, but you've got to suck up the short term process, you know, the long term process. You've got to, you've got to like realize that the big payoff days don't come until down the road, you know, and like, you know, just always ask yourself, am I making the right decision? And if you can honestly answer that, then you'll be rewarded. But if you let the ego keep coming into play, you'll get shot down every time. And I always say to athletes, look, look back in your year, reflect on it honestly. Was it the way it wa wanted to go, right? And then give me all your excuses, right? Let's put them down on paper. What can we change here? If you're not willing to change anything here, even though the season didn't go the way you wanted, then that's on you. You know what I mean? Definitely, definitely. Um, 
no, uh, ego needs to, to be put to a side. Uh, some, uh, at some points, it's good to hold yourself to a high standard. You know, it's always good to hold yourself to a high standard and be accountable. But when it comes to your training and training smart, it is important. Um, David, to put the, the ego aside, like you said, and, and listening to your body so, so you'll get that longevity. But um, David, I'm sure we could we could sit here all night talking about running and, and, and coaching and City of Smag and everything. That I know, man. Doing. Here, listen, man, I had I had 90% factor in my phone coming into this interview, and now I'm down to 5%, so we're <laughs> going to have to we're gonna have to I'm, wrap it up I'm, here. <laughs> I'm, I'm the exact same. My camera is, um, is flashing at me here with the... Uh, <laughs> with the uh, battery gone but no i really really appreciate you coming on david and as as you continue to grow with city as mag in that terms of of your running and your life and and, and your broadcasting um i'm def we'll definitely have you back on on the podcast and um, as as your broadcasting career with city as mag and, and on, on your own as an individual continues to grow we'll definitely have you back on to um share them experiences uh, with us so we do really appreciate you coming on the show I know. Cheers, Killian. And sure, listen, man. Uh, always a pleasure talking to another uh, uh, running fanatic and all things about the sport. Because, uh, like yourself, it's what we do, man. And it's what we're interested in. Um, and it's great to have uh, more people like it. So, for sure, man, we'll have uh, we'll have we'll have another another chat in the near future. Definitely. Well, once again, David, thanks so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you very very soon. Thank you, man. Cheers again, man. Bye -bye. Chat later.